Well, again, good morning. I hope you're having a good day. And I thought I was done talking about the desert, but I had something more I wanted to share about the desert today. And uh, I titled it, What Happens in Your Desert Shouldn't Stay in Your Desert. Do you know the, what I'm referring to there? <laughs> Let's read it. Deuteronomy 8. And there you go. Remember the whole way by which he, meaning God, brought, has brought you these 40 years through the wilderness so that he might, by humbling you, test you to see if you have it within you to keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you with unfamiliar manna. He did this to teach you that, the human, that humankind cannot live by bread alone but also by everything that comes from the Lord's mouth. Your clothing did not wear out, nor did your feet swell all these 40 years. Be keenly aware that just as a parent disciplines his child, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. And I think it connects to what Laurie prayed into today, the idea that about wrestling with God, that when God is dealing with us, there's a wrestling that happens. Our will, you know, God says I am, but self says I will, right? And, and there's enough of us for a lifetime in terms of self, in terms of what I want and, you know, me, mine, my pride. And the Israelites in the wilderness story was not about God punishing his people, but by letting them wander for 40 years in the desert. That's what it's about. That God was letting them wander for 40 years in the desert for a purpose. It was about God's schooling them in discipline so that they could have the capacity and character to live in the land. What do I mean by that? Have, have you ever heard of, of how many people win the lottery and they end up broke? It destroys their lives? Why is that? because they didn't have the capacity to steward the money they had. And when God calls us to, to new, new seasons or new places or, or new ventures in our lives, he first has to build in us the capacity and the character to live there. Because if he does it without training us, we fail. So there was this command to remember where he says, remember the whole way by which he has brought you these 40 years. And my tablet is freezing up today. That's really odd. So let's do this, and then we'll try it again. Okay. All right, let's try that. There you go. Well, maybe not. <laughs> so, so I say that to say this, that, that the Lord, he has a way of, of dealing with us and often, like, the way I, I grew up in church, it was very legalistic. And I, I told you this a million times, but it's true. And so whenever God dealt with you, it was always, it was always punishment, right? You always did something wrong. So God had to spank you. God had to, had to you know, call you out and just spank you. And so God was more like your boss than he, more than your boss than he was a father. And we find that, and I'm stuck here today, boy. Let me, let me just reset here. But I know my notes pretty well, so I'm, I'm good. All right? The old man still has it. So by, by the grace of Jesus. So, so first time in many years, because I've had this tablet for many years, and, and a few years, but, but um, the Lord has a way of, of dealing with us. And the point of, of this, whole, this whole message today is the idea that God, God wants you to remember what you learned in the wilderness. Because sometimes we, we, we go through the fire and we're glad to be out of there, but we, we don't take anything from it. We don't learn anything from it. All, all we learned was, well, Satan was attacking me and it's over now. But what if God was dealing with your heart? What if God was, was challenging you? What if God was building something in you? Are you aware of that? Do you see it for yourself? Do you sense that he is working in a mighty way? And so... So in, in these scriptures today, we, we see the fact that first there was this test, right? And, and this test involved, 
involve humiliation in a way, the Bible says. And let's try this again. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're good. So the lessons we learn in the desert, they must never remain there. And in the desert, you remember that you were tested at first in verse 2, 8, 2. And the testing happened in a hard place. Why doesn't God test you when you're on the beach? Because it's, it's, it's not appropriate, right? He, he tests you by putting you in a place that maybe is not comfortable, like a furnace or, or, you know, or a desert or some place where you're just really, really not comfortable because there's something about those places that kill the flesh. What is the flesh? It's the carnal part of you, the part of you that is selfish and wants your own way. It's the part of you that doesn't want to do God's will. And the desert and the furnace tends to kill those things in you. And so we find that God allows you to walk through spiritually void and dry places. And when you went through the desert experience, you felt like no one got you. That's why I'm kind of talking, talking about this in past tense in a way, because some of you have come out of your desert, and maybe some of you are still in the desert. I don't know. But, but the point is, is that in the desert, you feel isolated. That's why you feel like nobody gets you. That even if you're around people, you feel isolated. You can be in a crowd of people and still feel lonely because they don't get you. They don't know you. And when you see someone going through it, here's the lesson. When you see someone going through that, you don't give them shallow encouragement. Why? Because you've been there. You don't just say, well, I'll pray for you. No, you, you lay hands on them and you pray for them. <laughs> right? Or you say, you know what? I went through that. And the Holy Spirit helped me through it. And God's going to help you through it. Because I see that in Jesus' name. You speak prophetically to them. And you feel empathically for them what they feel. It's more than just, you know, the... When Jesus healed people, the key, they say, was that he had compassion on them. That was the key to the anointing. And have you ever heard someone share their pain and you feel compassion? That's when the gift is flowing. Step into that. Don't just say, well, I'll pray for you. No, ask the Lord, what do you want me to do right now for this person, Lord? So feel it with them and pray. But also, you learn this, you were humbled. Again, chapter 8 and verse 2. What was humbled? Our self-reliance, that's very, very hard, especially for those of you here who grew up independent because you maybe didn't have a parent there or you went through a divorce or something where you, you had to be your own person. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes that self-reliance can get to the point where we have problems trusting in the Lord. We have problems letting go and surrendering to him and saying, Lord, all of my life is before you and I surrender everything, even my, my capacity to do everything for myself. And that's what God has to break sometimes in us. And he doesn't try to break our self-esteem, but he tries to break our self-sufficiency. Does that make sense? Because God loves us. He's our father. He's not going to beat us up. He says, you know what? There's too much goat in you left. I got to get that goat out of you. That stubbornness. That, that, that thing that says, I built this with my strength. But Satan is different than God in this sense. Satan drives you with guilt, but God draws you with conviction. There's a big difference, isn't there? Have you ever been in a situation where, even in a service, where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just convicted you of something? And you felt like, oh. But Satan is the opposite. Instead of convicting you, he accuses you. And he condemns you. That's the difference. But we find that in being humbled... They were tested by being starved and fed. That, that's how God did it. Deuteronomy 8.3, So he humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you with unfamiliar manna. And I'm going to dwell on this point for a minute here, but heat and hunger and deprivation show you what is in your heart. Stress shows you what's in your heart. Going through the storm shows you what's in your heart. And they say that if you want to know somebody, play play an intense sport with them and you kind of see who they are. Isn't that true? Have you ever, have you ever played sports? And you see their temper and you see their, their attitude and you see what comes out of their mouth. And there's something about when we go through that wilderness that hopefully we saw something inside of us that we didn't see before. And being helped when you can't help yourself can also show you your own heart because it is very humbling when God deprives you of everything and says, you only get it from me. That's very humbling because I can't provide that. 
But we also find that the, the, the provision was in a way that was unfamiliar. I fed you with unfamiliar manner. In other words, God's provision comes in a way that I didn't expect. I'm like, wow, not in a million years, Lord, would I have expected for you to bless me that way. For you to bring your provision in that manner. I would have never have seen that coming. That's for you planners. God loves jumping out of your box. Because we like to have things boom, 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 boom. And God is like, mm mm. You either trust me or you don't. And I wish that I could just plan every second of my life. But man, God, God has his plans for my life. Have you ever thought that you knew something and, and, and you felt humble that you didn't? In other words, you felt knowledgeable about this subject. You're like, I know this subject like nobody. And then you met somebody and they blew your mind. You're like, I don't know nothing. That's humbling. I, I've known theologians like that, like, like re, people who, when they get up in the morning, you're like, Lord, anoint me to think today because they're theologians and they study his word. And I'm so blessed by them. I'm like, Lord, I want to learn from this guy or that, or that lady. They're brilliant. And there's something about humility that God is after in, in that desert. He, he humbles us so that we realize that he's the only one who provides. But what about this knowledge? I thought I knew myself. That's a scary thing. When you see something come out of you that you didn't know was there in, in your desert, an attitude or words, and you're like, where'd that come from? And when it comes out, God, God says, that's what I was after. I got what I wanted. Now it's out of you. Now we're dealing with your stuff. So here, here's, here's the lesson we, we draw out of it for other people. Remember when people go through their desert that they may not know themselves. They may not be themselves. They may be ugly on the inside, right? But you be patient with them. You pray for them. You bear with them. Why? Because you were there too. There were times where you were ugly on the inside. And I was ugly on the inside. Amen? And so we forget so quickly sometimes where we've been. And God is saying, remember where you've been because because. I do that so that you can bless somebody else and encourage them. That's why the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. Many Christians don't understand this scripture. They go, well, does that mean cover up sins that you can just do whatever you want? No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. It means that if, if I see you fall or you see me fall, you say, you know what? I'm not going to judge them. That's between them and God, but I'm going to pray for them. That's covering them. And in our, in, our, in our Western culture, we don't know how to do that, especially in America. It's, there's so much expose and uncovering and dishonoring all the time. But think about the principle in Genesis where Lot, the Bible says Lot, that, that's his name, Lot, he, he got drunk and, and he got naked. <laughs> so it's like, okay, he's, he's naked. And he was drunk, naked, and his one son saw him and made fun of him. But his two other sons said, no, look away. And they, they looked away and they, they took a, a big sheet and covered their father. That's what covering is. It's not exposing. It's, it's not feeling like I have to expose that other person. And today, many Christians have, have, gotten, have fixated on exposing and exposing and exposing that they've forgotten this whole principle that love covers the multitude of sins. Because you wouldn't want someone else to expose you like that. Are you with me? But also, you saw things about yourself. And we kind of said that already, but let me bear this out. He says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, to see if you have it within you to keep his commandments or not. What, what do we mean there? It means that God already knows the outcome. He's God. But do you know it? And there are certain things you have to see, and I have to see when we go through that. And the point isn't that God sees it, but that you see it. So that when you see it, you will never again doubt in your heart that you can survive the storm and the desert and the furnace. That's the point. He wants you to see it, that you can be an overcomer in that hard place. By his grace, by his strength, by his love. You see your motives in the desert. The Message Bible has this, has this kind of way of framing it in Deuteronomy 8.5. Uh, 
you learn deep in your heart that God disciplines you in the same ways a father disciplines his child. And that's one thing you see in the desert. You see God's motives. His motives is not to crush you or destroy you. It's to teach you because the word discipline is about teaching. It's about, it's about coming, into, uh, coming into the place where you're in God's school and you're learning it. You're getting it. You're like, wow, I'm really growing. I'm not the same man I was last year. My mind has changed about that. Have you ever thought about yourself like 10, 15 years ago and you're like, who was that? Anybody ever feel like that about themselves? And you see pictures and you're like, you know. But things came out of your mouth years ago that you, you can't believe they came out of your mouth. But hopefully if you've grown in the Lord, you've changed and you've matured. So the desert experiences show you how committed you are to God, but they also show you your own heart and they show you God's motives. You also see what God is building in you. James 1.3 1, 1, says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance, right? So you're learning endurance. Guess what? That, that's part of the schooling. I'm learning endurance. What's endurance? It, it's, it, it's that I'm not going to quit. I'm getting tougher. I can weather the storms. And let endurance have its perfect effect so that you will be perfect and complete and deficient in nothing. What does that mean, have, let it have its effect? It means you have to endure it for it to have its effect. It means you have to weather that storm. You have to walk through that desert. You have to stay in that furnace until the Lord says, okay, you, you did great. Get out now. You endured. So many Christians are weak in their faith. They, they've never learned how to endure because at, at the first sight of pain, they run away and they shrink back. And they don't see it as a growing experience. They don't see it as God is making a man. God is making a woman in, in the spirit. So I want to I partner with him. But they see it just as it threatens my comfort level. So I don't like this. God tested Abraham in a similar way in Genesis 22, 12, where it says, For now I know, and this is God speaking, that you fear God because you did not withhold your son, your only son from me. Again, God already knew the outcome. But he wanted Abraham to see it. He wanted Abraham to see, you can do this, Abraham. By my, by my grace, you can do this if you trust me. So it's not my job to judge people's motives. That's what God sorts out in the desert. So when you see people all messed up and struggling, you don't judge them. You pray for them. You don't compare them to your spirituality. You pray for them. You cover them in prayer. You don't say, I have to get this, a discernment and then criticize them, right? I, I've seen that in the, years ago in the body where I have the gifts, so they would start kind of judging those Christians. And, and that's a very, very mi bad, mis bad use of the gift that God gave you. But also you learn this in the desert. You learn provision. What we think is the lesson is not always the lesson. Sometimes the lesson, if you came from a very strict background like I did, was, well, God's punishing me. Well, I did something wrong. Well, I didn't pray hard enough. I didn't read the Bible enough. I wasn't nice enough. I, my motives in my heart weren't nice enough. My thoughts aren't right. And so God is just beating on me here. But what about this narrative? God is trying to teach me something. He wants me to see something. Do I see it yet? Do I see it in the spirit, what he's trying to tell me? I say that because sometimes in the desert we can fixate on God's motives of what's happening so much that we miss the whole lesson of what he's saying. First you see your own heart, then you see your own motives, but now you see that God's, God is the source of everything. That's the point of the desert. That's the underlying story of the whole thing, that it's not by bread that I live. It's not by my energy or my animus or my power that I live, but he's the one who makes provision for everything that I have. I've seen sometimes people say, well, I, you know, I work hard and I make all this money and I can do what I want. And, you know, they missed the whole point. God is the one who gave you the breath to do that and the strength in your body. It is his gift to you. Don't miss it. The kind of provision God gave was unique, an unending food supply, manna. 
and clothes that never wear out. Think about that. And health that survived in the harsh wilderness. Nobody swelled up, nobody got sick because God took care of them. His provision is in the heart place. He never fails us. So it's not the hay that, that you make that gets you through. And it's not the hard work that you do to get the food. But it's God who gives you the power to get wealth. Amen? God gives you the power. He gives you the breath to do it. So every day we thank God. Lord, thank you for the breath. Thank you for the health. Thank you for the power to do this. Because without you, I'm nothing. I can do nothing. That's why Jesus kind of modeled this when he was tempted and tested in the wilderness. He refused Satan's temptation to turn the stones into bread in Matthew 4, 3. Why? Because he knew that God did not decree that the stones should be turned into food. But God decreed that, hey, it's just bread and don't worry about it. I'm going to be your provision. That's the decree. And that's why we must resist the enemy in, in the wilderness to try to, try to ease that struggle with carnal means, with, phys with means that, are, that have nothing to do with God's provision in our life. So everything that I have, everything that I am, everything that I'll ever do comes from God. And that's why in the scriptures, when, when manna became such, such a thing, God told Aaron, he said, I want you to take a piece of manna and I want you to put it in a jar, in a clay jar, and I want you to place it next to the Ark of the Covenant for a memorial for all generations. What was he doing there? He was memorializing God's faithfulness. That's what we do in provision. We say, Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision. And I think it's good to even do that before you get the manna. Amen? By faith. See, thank you that you're going to provide. You're going to make the way where there is no way. In Exodus 16, 32, he gives the reason, so that they may see the food I fed you in the desert when I brought, when I brought you out from the land of Egypt. So what's the takeaway from the desert here? That we encourage anyone going through the, de the desert, that we say, God did it for me. He provided it for me, and he's going to do it for you. He's going to make a way for you. He made a way for me. That's my testimony to you. That's why it's important to know what you learned in your desert, because God wants you to impart that. Uh, he wants you to impart that to somebody else. But also, you learned absolute trust. And we're going we're gonna to bring this in for a landing in a minute here. They were being asked to follow more than the literal word of God, the mitzvah, the Ten Commandments. They were being asked to follow the creative word of God. What is the creative word of God? Miracles. That God would, by his word, create a miracle right on the spot at the point of your need. And that's why sometimes God brings us to points of desperation so that we'll know that he's the only one who made that provision. And that's why Jesus said it clearly, therefore I tell you in Matthew 6.25, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than clothing? So if God nourished Israel for 40 years, and they were whining and complaining the whole time, right? And he took care of them. How much more will he not take care of you in the desert and in the furnace and in the storm? So you also learned that something priceless was purchased in your wilderness. You bought something there. What do I mean by that? Revelation, the book of Revelation talks about buying gold refined in the fire. Not cheap gold that you can get anywhere else, but gold that, that you purchased by going through it, that you can't get by going to a class or by taking an online course, but you get it by going through it. And what you purchase in the hard places will have your heart and your investment, and it will mean something. It won't be this casual thing, this light thing. It'll mean something to you. That's why Samuel Rutherford once said, see that you buy the field where the pearl is, 
sell all and make a purchase. Do not think it easy, for it is a steep ascent to, to the eternal glory. What's he saying there? God wants you and I to be all in when we follow him. That when you see that truth, give all your heart to it. When you see what God is saying, give all your heart to it. I remember a, a, a couple of times when I was in prayer, sometimes God just, like, or, uh, he speaks to me in prayer, but he speaks to me when I'm dreaming, especially in my dreams, because sometimes when you're left brain, he's got to knock you out to talk to you, you know? And so, so uh, I remember w one night I was turning in my sleep, and I heard two words, and the words were this, bloodless prayer. And then I woke up and I knew exactly what God meant. And what was happening was, I was praying faithfully every day and, you know, seeking the Lord. But while I was praying, there were 58 things on my mind. And you're like, oh, boy, I, f I forgot to take care of that. You know, and I'm going to, oh, boy, I got to change my oil and I got to, I got to dust, you know, the side of my furnace and, you know, I got to, you know, all these useless things. And God, in a way, as, as my teacher, trying to teach me something, was saying, focus. <laughs> give me something that is worth, that, that costs you something. Don't just give me half-hearted. Do, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, so I'm challenging you to open your heart and your mind and your ears, your spiritual ears to the Holy Spirit. For anything he might want you to tweak and change and say, Lord, just show me and, and I'll, I'll make the adjustment the way Laurie said earlier. So we, so we purchase these truths. You can't read that in a book, really. You get that by going through it. I, I love something um, Dostoevsky said. He was a, a philosopher and just a brilliant man, and he had a relationship with God. He said, I believe in Christ and confess him, not like an ignorant person. My Hosanna has passed through an enormous furnace of doubt. That's how you know you're ready. It's been through the furnace and Satan can't kill it. It's already died. It's already been there. You see what I'm saying? So the point of, of today is that you don't keep what you've learned to yourself. That's why 2 Corinthians says this in closing. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may be able to comfort those experiencing any trouble with the comfort which we have ourselves, which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what you got blessed with in the desert, you bless somebody else with. That's the point of the scripture. That's what you take away from your desert. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. And I want to say this for the online, uh, benefit online. Visit destinychristianagra.com where you can find information, sermons, and events. You can also access our YouTube channel from, from there. Visit De uh, Destiny Christian Church Facebook, and, and uh, there's, there's a great uh, YouTube channel on there uh, from Lori. My people know my voice, right? Not hear my voice. They know my voice. I always confuse. My sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. And then check out my sheep know, yeah, there it is in my notes, my sheep know my voice. <laughs> and ways you can give here in person and through the Tidely app and through the website. But I want, I want to pray into this. You ever feel like God is, he'll never be done with us until Jesus returns. You know that, right? And even, even in heaven, we're going, to learn, we're going to learn new things. We're not going to strum harps and be bored all day. There'll be stuff to do and learn. So eternity begins now. Not, not when we die. It begins right now. And every moment is important. Every moment has meaning. So I want to pray into this. Father, thank you for every person here today. Thank you for those who are watching. And I pray, Lord, if someone hearing this does not know Jesus, that Jesus would visit them right now in Jesus' name. And if you're watching this this morning, and if you've never made a profession for Jesus Christ, this is the time to do it. The world is getting worse and worse more evil by the moment. And there's so much evil today that evil is called good and good is called evil. And if we miss that chance, we may never do it. So Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for someone right now that they would invite you into their heart and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and save me 
and cleanse me. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want to just be unfocused in my life. I don't want to just run around doing, doing this or that. I really want to know you. I want to be in eternity with you. I want to make a difference in this world. In your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus. So, Father, we pray also for those who heard this message today. Who are walking through the fire. They're walking through the wilderness, Lord. And we ask your Holy Spirit for each one that you will work in them. We ask God that you give them revelation in the desert, in the harsh places, in the furnace, in the storm. Let their spiritual ears be attuned to your voice. I pray for perspective, Lord, your perspective. I pray that you lift our minds above the, the dense clouds of darkness that try to cloud them sometimes. The attacks that many of us come under, Lord, in many ways. Lord, we know that in our world that there's, there's such an attack on Christianity in every way, in so many ways, everywhere you go. There's an assignment against it, but we're not surprised. It's an evil world, but you are a good God. You're an awesome God, and you want to transform this world. So, Jesus, we ask you for every person, every person who maybe has been to the desert, I pray that you anoint them to impart something that they learned so that they can give to somebody else. That, that mom who's hurting, Lord, who's, who's alone and just struggling. Lord, send someone who's been to the desert to minister to her. That dad, oh God, who's, who's struggling at work or maybe can't find a job. Lord, you see it. You see the loneliness. You see the despair everywhere. You see the oppression everywhere. You see how the enemy just wants to get people fixated always on evil things, always on the negative, and never on what you're doing and who you are. So Lord, we look to you by faith, and we ask you to work and continue to work and to break through for someone, Lord, in their desert. I pray that they would see the hand of God providing miraculously a creative word, Lord, of miracles in their moment. Lord, break the stalemate in someone's life. Break the stuckness. Break the tiredness. Lord, break the exhaustion and the, the constant cycle that keeps, keeps repeating for somebody. Lord, break the fear, the doubts, the uncertainty. And I pray that you teach us what it means to be obsessed with you in a beautiful way to focus on who you are in the name of Jesus. So we speak blessing to all those who are watching today, all those who are here. We speak life and grace and strength and your peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we thank you, Father. Amen.